Give me permission now. I'll kill all of your church members. <laughs> and out of you, I will raise up a company of priests and kings will worship me in spirit and truth. What will you say? Hallelujah, Lord. That's what I want, Lord. Get rid of all these thorns in my flesh. Get rid of all these pains, Lord, from me. I think we would have done that, no? But not Moses. He said, Lord, he went on his knees and he pleaded with God. Although, you know, those people were also a pain to Moses. They were a bunch of stiff-necked, ungrateful people who are always murmuring and grumbling. Always murmuring and grumbling. How would you like Pastor Robinson? You have an entire church of grumblers and complainers. <laughs> every day you need treatment from your doctor wife. She needs to give you medicine every day. Right, Pastor Jim? You have a whole church, not one or two grumblers, you know. Three million grumblers. What a blessed church. <laughs> It should be called the first church of grumblers. <laughs> Can you imagine what Moses went through day and night? Yet, he came and he pleaded to God, Lord, no Lord, no Lord. You cannot kill them, Lord. You cannot kill them. You see, he transcended his flesh and dwelt in agape love. Amen. What was demonstrated in that prayer is what in the New Testament is called the agape love. It was not his flesh, because his flesh would want them to be killed. Because later on, he said, he was so angry, he lost his cool, and he told them, shall I bring water for you? That was the climax, you know, he has been bottling up from the day they left from Egypt, he has been patient and patient and patient. Now the cattle was about to burst over. And that was the great mistake he made, for which he paid a heavy price. Uncontrolled anger. That lost the greatest thing that he was looking forward to. Stepping into the promised land. That was his passion. Eighty years of ministry was that one final moment and he lost it. But here you see his heart. Number four, the Apostle John. What is about him? God revealed secrets to him. In Amos 3, 7 it says, God reveals his secrets to the prophets. Now, God revealed when they were having their last supper, there was a talk among everyone who was going to betray the Lord Jesus. Because the Lord Jesus simply said, one among you is going to betray me. So there were 12 guys. They were all asking, is it me? Is it you? And Peter obviously said, I know, it must be him. Because they were also pointing fingers, no? Must be him, must be that person. So, and uh, John was seated right beside the Lord. And Peter knew the close relationship that John had with the Lord. So he tucked Peter, John, John, come on, ask them. Don't you do that? <laughs> Tuck him. Come on, you ask him, you ask him, you ask him. And you know what John did? Before he could say anything, he just lied on the bosom of the Lord's neck, chest, just lied there. Once he lied there, you know, like a baby will come and lie on the chest of the mother. Once the baby does that, the first thing a mother does is put her arms and embrace the baby. Don't you do that, mothers? Right? You, just a bonding between a mother and the baby. At that moment, when he felt the embrace of the Lord's hands, John knew this is the right time. <laughs> so he said, Lord, who is this? 
it is the person to whom I will give this bread. You see, the Lord revealed the secret. He revealed the secret because of the relationship. What is that bosom? That bosom is the secret place of the Most High God. In Psalms 91 verse 1. John 13 verse 23 says, that's the bosom. That is the secret place of the Most High God. If you read John chapter 1 verse 18, it says that the Lord Jesus Christ dwelled in the bosom of God. And that bosom, John 13 25 tells us, is a place of intimacy and union. So, I've shown you four saints of God who pleaded with God to know and to change. Now the next question is, what qualities these men had that God was entreated by them and moved by them? What qualities did they have? Four qualities. Number one, they had found favor and grace in God's eyes. That's the first quality. Exodus 33, verse 13 and 17. The prophet Moses prayed, Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, if I have found grace in your eyes, let me see your face. And because he has found that favor, because he found the grace, you know, the Lord told Moses, Moses, I cannot show you my face because no man can see my face and live. That is a law. Then, you know, Moses looked at God's face. You know, sometimes little children, they come with that pitiful look on their face, looking at the mother. And when the mother sees that face, how can the mother say no? Right? Am I right, mothers? You can never, that, you know, children, they are so smart. <laughs> They'll put on that mask and come with that look. And how can you say no? When they're so cherubic, so cute, like no one else like them exists in the entire world. <laughs> right? Am I right, mothers? So, Moses had that look. The Lord looked at him. Okay, Moses. Let me do something for you. See, loophole. He created a loophole. Let me do something for you. There is a place by me. You come and meet me there. I will pass by. But you cannot see my face. However, I will show you my back. Let me just be satisfied with that. You see, that is the place of favor. Favor and grace. So that is the first quality they had. Secondly, they had an intimate relationship and walk with God. Not just a superficial Christianity. Not just a Sunday Christian. You have a deep, intimate walk and fellowship with God. Relationship with God. That's what will bring you beyond the veil. If you want to walk beyond the veil, cross beyond the veil, you must have an intimate walk with God. Where you are willing to pay the price. If God calls you to come and wait before Him in the night watches, you must be willing to pay the price. You know, nothing comes cheap or automatic. It's not like I lay my hands on you and everything that's in me is transferred to you. You must pay the price. Now let me tell you, if you got something like that, you will quickly lose it. So better for you to pay the price and get it than receive it by impartation. Some gifts are imparted by impartation. But those are just gifts. You know, there is a big difference between the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the seven spirits of God. It's a big difference. One is grace manifestation. That is for everybody. 
even whether you are a new believer or old believer. The nine gifts of the Holy Spirit can manifest in anyone's life, but not the seven spirits of God. They will only come upon those people who meet this criteria, this category. And when the gifts come, they stay permanently. It's not a manifestation as and when, when there is a need. It will just come and rest upon the person and you are always anointed with that anointing. Amen. It's always like 24-7. The gifts are not like that, you know. They will only come when there is a necessity, when there is a need. But not the seven spirits of God. Once they rest on you, they rest on you. Amen. And when you see, you will see beyond the flesh into the hearts, into the minds. You are transformed. You are taken in the spirit. It all becomes effortless. And Moses was willing to pay the price. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 9 to 11. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights two times. He says, I never eat food. I went and stood before God. Thirdly, they loved God with all their heart. You know the scripture says very clearly, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all that is within you. Why must it specifically say heart, mind, soul, strength? Why? There must be a reason, right? So it means that with your entire whole being, that He is your first love, not second love. First love, only love. Every other relationship in this world, you know, is vanity. They are not real. Husband-wife relationship is not real. It's vanity. If it's really real, then people won't be divorcing each other, right? If they are divorcing each other, it means even that relationship is not real. A mother-son, mother-daughter relationship, that's also vanity. It's not real. All relationship in this world is vanity. It's not true, except the relationship with God. That's the only thing that lasts forever. Everything else has a expiry date, right? Even good friends don't last forever. Something will crop up and that friendship ends, right? Church members don't stay forever in a church. They say, suddenly they'll come, Pastor, the Lord told me to leave this church. <laughs> you know, initially I used to believe all those things. Then later on I found out, God is not speaking. They felt that they don't like this church anymore. They just feel inside them. But you must make yourself look very spiritual. So you come and tell your pastor, God told me, leave your church and start another church just two blocks away. See, even that is not real. The commitment is not real. So what is real? Only God is real. Amen. 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 If God is the only real thing, why shouldn't you give your life for that God? If that's the only thing, why can't you? It is worth dying for such a love like the love of God. Amen. Amen? Amen. Worth dying for that because it lasts forever, even unto death and beyond. Every other relationship is only up to the grave. It don't last beyond, but only the love of Christ goes beyond that goes beyond the grave Amen. with you forever in eternity. Amen. So that being the case, it is worth dying 
for such a great love. Amen. 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 Fifth quality or fourth quality, they cared for God's people more than they cared for themselves. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 18. That's what Moses did. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights for the people. They had sinned. So he went to fast and he never ate any morsel of bread or water, not for his sake, for the people's sake, so that they will be safe. So in conclusion, it is such a people that one man, you know Ezekiel 22, 30 to 31 says this, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. Now look at the first part of the scripture. So I sought for a man, one man. I used to wonder for a long, long time until this morning. You know, there's so many people are praying. I used to tell the Lord, Lord, you, your word says you sought for one man. But here there are more than one people who are praying. So why can't you answer? So this morning, I was made to understand who is that one man that God's looking for. That one man should have these qualities. Only that one man will be able to stand before God and stop his hand. That one man who is like a prince. That one man who walks with God on a very intimate level. That one man who dares God. And that one man who has, who lies on the bosom of God. These four qualities, like the four men, you should have. Who knew God. Who's that one man? This one man is someone who knew God's grace and goodness. Jeremiah 30, verses 11 to 13. This one man is someone who knows how to contend together with God like Jacob. Isaiah 43, verse 26. This one man is someone who knows how to bring forth strong reasons and present his case before God like how Moses did. Exodus 32 verses 9 to 14. This one man is someone who knows how to reason together with God. You know the Hebrew word for reason together means let's talk this over together like Abraham. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. This is that one man who knew God's goodness and grace. You must understand that. Once you understand the goodness and the grace of God, then you will know how to approach God. If you look at all these saints in the Bible, how they pray, you will always find they will appeal to the goodness of God. Say, Lord, you are a good God. You are a long-suffering God. You are so long-suffering. You are full of wonderful kindness. Why can't you forgive this? Why can't you do something about this? You are a long-suffering God. You are abundant in goodness. You keep your mercies for a thousand generations. But this is just one generation. Why can't you, your mercy stretch out over there? See, you must, be, you must know the goodness of God. Once you know the goodness of God, then you can approach God in that manner. Once you know the goodness of God, you know the step that you take forward is no more fear. You step before God with the full assurance that God will hear you. Because He's a good God. He doesn't chase you away. There's no doubt in your heart whether God will receive me or not. Whether He will hear me or not. Those doubts disappear. Because He's a good God. He'll always hear you will never cast you away. So you must know the first thing, goodness of God. 
Secondly, you must learn how to contend with God like Jacob did. Never let go until you are hurt. Keep on contending, keep on contending, keep on contending until you are hurt. Never, never let go. Thirdly, you must be able to bring forth strong reasons. You know, sometimes you are pleading with God. God will ask you, why should I bless that person? Tell me, why? Why should I lengthen his life? Tell me the reasons. I, this has been my experience, you know. Sometimes when I'm praying for the people, the Lord, the Lord asks me this question, why should I bless him? This is what he has done. He points out all the sins they have done. So why should I bless him? How can I bless him? Then you need to bring forth a strong reason, present your case like a lawyer, like an advocate, like an attorney. You need to fight your case. That's what I do when I'm praying. I'll, I'll present all my case. I'll prepare my case studies, you know. Amen. Amen. I do my homework first. Read all the scriptures concerning this situation. Then I take it up before the Lord. I say, Lord, this is what your word says. This is what your word says. This is what he has done for you, Lord. Why should I bless him? These are the reasons why you should bless him. Because this is what they have done. You know, once I was praying, asked to pray for a dying man in India. And uh, I went to the hospital. This man was in his last. The doctors have given him three days to live. They was put an oxygen mask on him. So I stood there to pray. And the Lord Jesus appeared there and he said, he will not die. I mean, he will not live, he will die. So I turned to his daughter and said, uh, you know, this is what the Lord told me. That woman knelt down, she held my hand, she started crying and weeping. She said, no, 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 Satuji. You, if you pray, God will answer this prayer. I said, how can I pray? The Lord is saying that he will die. She said, no, 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 I don't care. You pray. <laughs> Many times I'm put in difficult positions, you know. And I didn't know what to do now. So I, I turn, turn around and look at the Lord. I said, Lord, can you give me one reason why this man should die? He looked at me and he said, I'll not give you one reason, I'll give you three reasons. And the Lord gave me three reasons why this man should die. So now I didn't know what to do. Because I asked for one reason, he gave me three reasons. In the mouth of two or three, everything shall be established. Right? So I turned to his daughter and told him, you know, I don't think your father will leave. And the more she cried, and she pleaded with me, only you can do something. God will always hear your prayer. You please do something. I said, all right, what shall I do now? So I asked the Holy Spirit, please teach me how to pray now. He is our safety net. Right? The Bible says in Romans 8, 26, we do not know how we ought to pray, but the Holy Spirit will teach you how to pray. So I prayed. I said, Holy Spirit, please, this is what the Lord is saying. This is what these people are saying. I don't know what to do now. So please teach me how to pray. And the Holy Spirit told me, Okay, this, the Lord told you three things. Now you tell the Lord these other three things. And you present your case before the Lord now. So I, I told the Lord, Lord, these are the reasons why this man should live. He said, one, two, three. And the Lord looked at me. Because you asked, I will do this for you. And he extended that man's life extended his life beyond what the doctor said will be. And on the day that he's supposed to die, he was discharged and he went home. So, bring forth your strong reasons. Amen. Finally, reason together. You know, God is a very, very good God. A very reasonable God. He'll say, come, let's sit down, let's talk. Why should I answer your prayer? Come on, let's sit down and talk. Like a father-son, you know. 
Say, come, let's sit down. Let's talk this over. Sometimes he, he has all these good reasons. So this is the reason why you should not do this. Say, no, Lord, I think these are the reasons. Why I should bless you? Why you should bless them? Because they have done this lot. They have done that lot. Remember, when Dorcas died, Peter was... The people in Dorcas church, they came and told him, you know, this woman has done so much of good things. This woman has done so much of wonderful things. They were presenting all her goodness to Peter. See, that is a good picture for you. They presented all these good points to Peter. And Peter took it up and he realized, okay, this woman should live. And he contented with God. Lord, this woman should not die. I want her life back. And she was resurrected. Right? Let's sit down and talk together. You must sit down and talk together with God. See, never, never rush in prayer. You don't kneel down or just bow your head and pray a two-minute prayer and say, Amen, done. If you pray like that, you will have to conduct so many funeral services. You'll get nothing done. If you want to move God, now we have a big danger before our eyes over this nation. To move an entire nation, it's not going to be an easy thing. But it is possible. It is possible to turn this...